Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black, Bespoke Radio, for the masses, uh, yeah, that's right, today's Monday, the 4th of July, 2022, happy 4th of July, everybody, let's do this. <laughs> I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer, and UnX Networks. Race Hobbs. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Happy 4th of July, everybody, and thank you for being here tonight. It's a very special show, because tonight, our very special guest is me. And tonight, I am giving a full two-and-a-half-hour presentation on aliens and exoplanets. I hope I get it all in. I've got a lot of, lot of stuff lined up for tonight. And I had so much fun doing this last Monday. I decided to do this this Monday, and it was the 4th of July. And I thought, you know, we're going to have our family hanging out with us tonight. And so I thought it would be a lot of fun if it was just us. Okay, so that's what we're going to do tonight. And uh, I've got... Uh, two really cool guests lined up for tomorrow and Wednesday. And I'm going to make those announcements uh, tomorrow. And uh, there's reasons for that, but uh, you can deal with it. And then Thursday is another fader night and that may change too as well. So, but for now, Thursday is another fader night, but I may have a special guest on Thursday night. So things are in flux. Just work with me on this. Okay. All right. Uh, this show, tonight's show, is dedicated to Brian Conroy. And before I get a lump in my throat, um, uh, I knew Brian for... Uh, well, exactly uh, 30 years since 1992 and a guitar player. And uh, it was just four short months ago. I spoke to him the day that he got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I talked to him from the hospital that day. And I talked to him uh, a few times over that week. And then a couple of more times, and uh, he just felt strange, and uh, and then just died, and uh, it's heartbreaking, and uh, it's it, a tremendous monster of a guitar player, and I just enjoyed his company, and uh, he was just a just a good dude and and a cool dude, and he has left this earth. So Brian, this show is uh, dedicated to you, my man. All right. All right. So there you go. I'm just, I'm, I'm heartbroken, but it's the 4th of July. 
The show must go on, and Brian knows that. All right. Okay. <sighs> How about some coffee? How you doing? I'm crushed. <sighs> Brian was an amazing player. All right. Uh, right now, you can get your free membership to the UnX Network at the UnXNetwork.com, and you will receive the monthly newsletter. You're going to get access to the blog. You're going to get event notices and a free digital copy of their quarterly magazine. Check it out right now. I want you to go to unxnetwork.com, our network, the Unx Network, and get your free membership over at the unxnetwork.com. And if you just forgot that, the link is below. All of the links for all of our sponsors are in the description box below. They're over at jimmychurchradio.com, and we have them throughout social media. So go now and get your free membership to the UnX Network. You can follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Yeah, you can do that. Go follow me on Instagram at jimmychurchradio. Over on Instagram, check that page out. <laughs> there you go. All right. Any questions or comments? Hashtag F2BQ. If you want to follow along tonight with the rest of the fade or not, hashtag F2B is the sandbox. And, of course, we have chat rooms open uh, on multiple networks and over at YouTube. All right. All right. It's going to be a busy night on the show. Tonight is a huge deep dive into aliens and exoplanets. Um, two and a half hours. It's going to be something that you're probably going to watch more than once. And uh, I, I think uh, the information is, is uh, not only is it comprehensive, but hopefully you're going to learn something, okay? And, and watch this show many, many times in the future. And uh, so before we get to all of that, Man, my brain is going to be toast at the end of the night tonight. So for now, before, before I unleash my frontal lobes, let's get to the breaking news. That's right. It's the 4th of July. All hail the hot dog king. Joey Chestnut won his seventh consecutive Nathan's hot dog eating contest title. And 15th overall with a ridiculous, are you ready for this? 63 hot dogs and their buns eaten in 10 minutes. The next closest competitor, 43 hot dogs. The 38-year-old Chestnut's feat was even more impressive after he arrived at Coney Island on crutches. He said he suffered a ruptured tendon earlier this year but claimed it hadn't affected his ability to defend his title. Chestnut's 15th title surpassed Rafael Nadal's 14th French Open titles for the most championships in a single event. 63 hot dogs. <laughs> uh, I can do like, I can do two for sure, three. Maybe four, 63. That's nuts. All right. You know what the big news is today. After a three-year hiatus, the LHC, we call it CERN, has been turned back on and is probing the fundamental nature of reality. The world's largest, most powerful particle accelerator housed at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, near Geneva, Switzerland, is booted back up after being shut down for maintenance, repairs, and upgrades in 2018. As of this past Friday morning, two beams of protons had started circulating in the opposite directions around the 27-kilometer-long Large Hadron Collider. Physicists hoped the resumption of collisions will help in their quest for so-called dark matter that lies beyond the visible universe. Dark matter is thought to be five times more prevalent than ordinary matter, but does, does not absorb, reflect, or emit light. 
searches so far have come up empty-handed. I'll keep you posted with the results at CERN. All right. Researchers have discovered never be so, never seen before types of crystals hidden in tiny grains of perfectly preserved meteorite dust. The dust was left behind by a massive space rock that exploded over Chelyabinsk, Russia, nine years ago. You remember when that went down. The new crystals came in two distinct shapes, quasi-spherical or almost spherical, shells and hexagonal rods. The researchers wrote all of this up in a study. Further analysis using x-rays revealed that the crystals were made of layers of graphite, a form of carbon made from overlapping sheets of atoms commonly used in pencils. You remember pencils, right? (laughs) Surrounding a central nanocluster at the heart of the crystal. So there you go. And uh, they're using electron microscopes right now. I haven't seen any published images, but when I get them, I will post them. Well, you remember the song, American Woman, right? You remember that song? It's a rock anthem. And one of the biggest hits to come out of the 1970s. In 1976, however, guitarist Randy Bachman of the Guess Who discovered that the guitar he used to write the classic and a string of other hits had been stolen from his hotel room. The theft haunted Bachman for the last 50 years. He poured over thousands of images online looking for a distinctive mark by the volume knob. And then Randy spotted an orange Gretsch at a vintage guitar shop in Tokyo. It was a perfect match. but. The Gretsch was already sold to a musician named Takeshi, who Bachman found online. Playing a Christmas song in a video, by the way. And uh, Takeshi returned the guitar when Bachman just played Japan. He got the guitar in trade for one of Randy's other Gretches that replaced the stolen Gretch. Actually, that Randy had made the same week that the Gretch was stolen. That's another story right there. But now, all is right with the world. An unknown threat actor has taken to underground forums to advertise a batch of 23 terabytes, 23 terabytes, of sensitive data stolen from a database belonging to the Shanghai Police Department. The data is said to contain people's names, addresses, birthplaces, national ID numbers, phone numbers, and information on any criminal cases the individuals are involved in. All of this going down right now in China. The mystery attacker was asking for 10 Bitcoin in exchange for the data, which translates to roughly $200,000 at the current market rate. There's been no word from the Shanghai police, and the Cyberspace Administration of China is still silent on the matter as well. But late last night, a billion Chinese resident records went up for sale on the dark web. That's right. China should have given up that 10 Bitcoin. Oh, well, maybe the Chinese were waiting for Bitcoin to continue to tumble. But it's been holding steady at 20 grand all day long. So there you go. A vampire slaying kit once owned by a British aristocrat sparked an international bidding war uh, before selling for six times its estimated price, according to Hansen's auctioneers. The late 19th century box kit, which sold last Thursday for $15,736.49, belonged to Lord William Malcolm Haley, who died back in 1969. Now check this out. The kit, you should see the pictures, features all those essential items needed to ward off bloodthirsty vampires, including crucifixes, holy water, a wooden stake, 
and its matching mallet, rosary beads, a gothic Bible, brass candlesticks, matching pistols, and a brass powder flask. All that for the paltry sum of $15,736.49. I wanted it. Let's get this show cracking on this day in history. OTD, we know it went down. 1776 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on July 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress adopts the Declaration of Independence, which proclaims the independence of the United States of America from Great Britain and its king. But also on this day, in 1997, after traveling 120 million miles in seven months, NASA's Mars Pathfinder becomes the first U.S. spacecraft to land on Mars, allegedly, in over 20 years. And that went down in 1997. All right. Now, another 4th of July fader fact. There's a village in the Spanish region of Malaga that also celebrates the 4th of July. Like, for real. It was the birthplace of Bernardo de Galvez, one of the founding fathers of the United States who supported the colonists in the Revolutionary War. Bet you didn't know that. But that is your fader fact. All right. Tonight we have a very special guest here on Fade to Black. That special guest is me. That's right. And tonight I am giving a full two and a half hour presentation on aliens and exoplanets. Thorough, comprehensive data, images. I've got over 50 charts, illustrations, graphics, pictures. That's right. Which uh, average out uh, to a 10 per segment. I don't know how I'm going to get it all done, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Tomorrow, we're going to announce a Tuesday and Wednesday's guest because I'm shuffling things and I may have to move something over to Thursday, which is fader night. I don't want to do that, but I may have to, which will move fader night to Wednesday, maybe Tuesday, because tomorrow's guest is traveling right now and they don't know if they're going to be available tomorrow or Wednesday. So you know what? Everything is TBA. Yeah, it's 4th of July. I should have just taken this week off. But I can't do that. Not with the fader knots. I, I, I never will. Right now, I need to hit this River Moon coffee. Let me tell you what the best combo is. River Moon coffee and Brain Peak 9. Right there. Brain. Oh, that's the back. Brain Peak 9. Two-month supply in this box. That's right. Two a day, Brain Peak 9. I've got stuff on this side of the screen. I don't know if this is showing up. Brain Peak 9. Incredible. Two months supply right now. It's specialed. So click on the link below. I think the promo code's Fader. Yeah. Fader. I think that I think that's what you do. It's in the link below. Just just click on it and get yourself some Brain Peak 9. I I you know what? I love this stuff. <laughs> How do you think I'm able to do two and a half hours straight presentation, graphics, the writing, the thought process? There's only one way. Brain Peak 9. I, I, this is not a joke. I wake up every day. I'm like, my, my Brain Peak 9. It's, it's okay. It helps you remember things. And uh, and and putting stuff together for this show, uh, you know, I space out and procrastinate. Now, down with Brain Peak, I'm just like, I just remembered something. <laughs> I get to the but okay, Brain Peak Nine. 
All right. Oh, man. The calm before the storm. Two and a half hours of aliens and exoplanets coming up. But first, it's 4th of July weekend. And I was busy all weekend. I worked. But I also got a little time off. I got some entertainment in. I just finished The Man Who Fell to Earth. Showtime. Amazing. And uh, 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 a different take, similar but different, modern version of the Bowie classic, the film, The Man Who Fell to Earth, which I watched, again, a couple of weeks ago uh, in the middle of this. So I just finished that. I also just finished The Terminal List starring Chris Pratt and, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Marvel, Chris Pratt. And he's not funny in this. I don't think I don't think there was one joke. Ten episodes. <laughs> no, this is a different version of Chris Pratt. And you could tell by the end of this uh the season finale that there's definitely going to be a season two. So you've got more serious Chris Pratt coming up is pretty good. And I also finished Stranger Things. I did everything, completed everything. Series finale, two season finales, all in one weekend. Now, the man who fell to earth was easy. Uh, I only had to watch one episode. Um, it's showtime. You can't watch everything all at once. You can't binge it unless you wait for the season to end. And then you watch everything at one time. But uh, this this series was just too good. And I watched it one episode per week like I'm doing right now with the Orville. Enough on that. Um, the Orville, that is. Um, the man who fell to earth... Uh, pretty incredible. Um, an unexpected ending. Um, and I'm assuming I don't want to do any spoilers. Uh, let me let me circle back to that. Um, the Terminal List was a serious ten episode binge uh, that started uh, midweek last week, and it was just one of those things where. I know when I start to binge something, and I know that you do the same thing. First episode, it's a new series. You don't know what's going on. and You've got all 10, 12 episodes up there in front of you. Um, it's got one. Ep- it's got no. Wait a minute. Let's say it's a one hour show. It's got 15 minutes to grab you. Or I've got I've got five or 10 series right now. On my continue watching, right? <laughs> you can see, right? You got this, uh, the the full view, right? The, you can see that I've watched five minutes. And if it doesn't get me in those five minutes, that's it. I, I just won't go back to it. The flight attendant, season two, ah, bailed on it. <laughs> so many more. But uh, the terminal has got me. It got me. Oh, by the way. Uh, the sun is setting. I've, uh, uh, I'm watching things now. We're probably going to have some loud fireworks tonight during the show. It's the 4th of July. Um, so if you hear something going on, that's what it is. Uh, but the terminal list is worth it. So go and check that out. It's, uh, uh, man, no spoilers. I don't want to do it. Secret agent, secret agent, seal team six stuff. Pretty good. Chris Pratt, SEAL Team. Go check it out. It's worth it. Now, Stranger Things. Stranger Things was pretty easy. It wasn't a 10-episode binge. I think it was just four episodes uh, to complete the series. Uh, Again, no spoilers here. Um, There were so many things going on. They split the season in half. And the, the way that they left the first half of this season... There's like five, six, seven storylines going on at the same time, um, seemingly everywhere, including Russia. And with with all of this happening, I just thought, how how are they going to do this? So I thought I didn't bother to check, but I was thinking that there was going to be another six, eight episodes uh, to wrap all of this up. 
The last four episodes, which is the series finale, that's it. That's the end of Stranger Things. Um, it was rapid fire, uh, these uh, four episodes. And it seemed to happen really, really fast. And the next thing you know, you're at the, uh, the end of the series. And uh, a good ending. Good ending. Yeah, yeah. Again, no spoilers here. But when it got to the end of this... I'm just going to tell you this. So when you get there, I want you to think about what I'm about to say. When the ending was happening and I'm watching it, it's there's like 15 seconds left and I can see that. I'm like, wait a minute. There's got to be another episode, right? There's look at Hawkins. There's, there's, there's got to be another episode. But they left it right there. And in a strange way for Stranger Things, in a strange way, it was uh, pretty satisfying. And it was uh, uh, an amazing, amazing ending. Cam Priest says, watching the night sky. That's incredible. I pounded that out. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I had to wait. That was week to week, too. That was like 10 episodes. But, Ken, you're a little late, man. I, I finished that like a month ago. <laughs> It's good, though. An incredible ending uh, to that. So that was my weekend. I recommend all of these uh, series uh, to everybody. The Man uh, Who Fell to Earth is is incredible, uh, very fast-paced, and very well-written. And it is a modern take of the Bowie classic. Uh, but The Terminalist with uh, Chris Pratt is uh, very addicting. And Chris Pratt shows that he is so much more than just a, a comedic actor because he's very funny. He's a great, great, funny comedic actor. Amazing. No jokes in the terminal list. And Stranger Things is Stranger Things. So there you go. I've got to, um, I think the next time that you see me, I may have a Hellfire Club t-shirt. Yeah. All right. Let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, right here, when we come back after the break, we will start a two-and-a-half-hour presentation on aliens and exoplanets. It's the deep dive for real. I am your host, Jimmy Church, of the Game Changer and Unex Networks, Race Hobbs. This is Fade to Black. I will be right back with this presentation of aliens and exoplanets right after this short break. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that knocks the net. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fate to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This 
defense is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the UnXNetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the UnXNetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 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 Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Before we get things started, we're going to run limited uh, commercials tonight. So I want you to check out the thunderstorm. This is mine. It sits in the studio. You can, it's quiet. You can get the three pack special right now with free shipping. Just click on the link below for all of you fader knots. Promo code is fader three, the thunderstorm. Kills viruses, smells like rain. It's incredible. I keep it here in the bunker running all day. It just it just runs. Okay, here we go. Uh, tonight I will be doing a full presentation of uh, two and a half hours of aliens and exoplanets. And uh, I'm going to do a few things uh, to get ready for this. One... I am going to get rid of that because I need full screen. I need everything up. There's going to be a lot of images and a lot of information uh, that is going to follow. Um, I have been interested in this subject uh, since the discovery of uh, the first exoplanets. Uh, We are going to uh, go through all of that tonight. And of course, what may be visiting us here on this planet, and we have Um, All of the conversation about UFOs and UAPs that is going down with the Department of Defense, uh, the UAP task force, of course, the Senate, the House of Representatives, uh, the efforts of uh, Lou Elizondo and uh, Chris Mellon and others. And uh, it is uh, an extraordinary time. And while all of this is going on, we have the Galileo Project, we have Harvard University, of course, um, and Avi Loeb. And we have the other side of all of this, which is the science and the facts behind it. 
um, and the search for exoplanets and the search for alien life. And I talk about this subject nearly every single night on the show when I talk about all of the multiple fronts where this information is coming at us, right? And we have we have it all happening at the same time in the media coverage. And, and But what is going on with the science side of things? So that's what we are going to do tonight. And uh, so get ready for all of that. And uh, I am going to uh, kick things off uh, with a, a couple of direct things, and we're going to do uh, a little bit of history and uh, and go backwards and then, of course, move forward. But uh, this presentation, like I said, is uh, very com comprehensive, and there is a – whoo, that was a big boom – right over the top of my house. It is the 4th of July. So um, here we go. Let's get things started. And um, in this presentation, um, as uh, we start to uh, uh, understand how we got here, uh, let's start with Copernicus. Copernicus was born in 1473. He died in 1543 at the age of 70. Uh, Copernicus formulated a model of the universe that placed the sun rather than the earth at its center. His book on the revelations of celestial spheres, published just before his death in 1543, was a major event in the history of science because it triggered the Copernican revolution and kick-started the scientific revolution. His importance to all of this uh, cannot be measured. And the other part uh, with uh, Copernicus is the development of, of lenses and telescopes and experimenting on getting the best and clearest images. And a lot of the scientists uh, back then were friends and they were sharing information and they were trying to perfect these methods of looking to the heavens. Then came Galileo. Now, Galileo was born in 1564, uh, 20 years after the death of Copernicus. A lot of people think that they lived at the same time. They did not. Galileo died in 1642. Now, of course, Galileo championed uh, heliocentrism, uh, everything based on uh, Copernicus, you know, that the earth is rotating daily right? And revolving around the sun. And he fought the Vatican over this until his death. And of course, the later part of his life was spent under house arrest. Now, next here, I want you to look at uh, this image, and I am going to uh, take this up a scale. And I want you to look at uh, the telescope here, okay? Because here, are Ga Galileo's telescopes, and this image are this image are two of his telescopes that are on display in a museum in Italy. Now, for the next, just imagine what Galileo was doing with those, you know, and changing the world. Now, over uh, the next uh, two hundred years, now remember. Uh, as we look at uh, these these time scales here, Galileo died in 1642. And uh, for the next 200 years, astronomy progressed. Telescopes got bigger. They got better. But things were just static. Yes, discoveries were made. Things were getting measured. But it wasn't until 1923 when Edwin Hubble made his breakthrough observations. And Edwin Hubble, and let me uh, kick this up a notch right here. Edwin Hubble uh, and uh, his discoveries, he made two uh, nearly back-to-back. -back. And it, uh, it was an incredible time. He looked to the heavens, and as he was watching... The sky. Well, there was two things that happened. First, 
while looking at gaseous nebulae, which is what astronomers called them, were these blobs up in the night sky. And from the southern hemisphere, you can see them with the naked eye. Um, and he discovered and proved that they weren't gaseous blobs, but other galaxies. And specifically, he was looking at Andromeda. And the second thing that he proved was the universe was expanding. Now, up until this point, science thought, including Albert Einstein, that our universe was static, that nothing moved. It was completely unmoving. And uh, these were two huge, huge discoveries for astronomy. This is the photographic plate that Edwin Hubble uh, used, photographed from his Palomar Observatory. And you can see on this plate, it says 6 October 1923. That blob in the center, that's Andromeda. And that's what he was looking at every night. And, you know, figured out that that was a galaxy. But then he also noticed that stars were moving, objects were moving uh, in this that shouldn't be. And once they did the measurements and uh, the conclusion was made and proven that our galaxy was indeed expanding. Now, um, Copernicus and Galileo proved that the sun was at the center of our star system, and Hubble discovered galaxies beyond our Milky Way. But what about other planets? And this was another, uh, you know, one of the biggest questions that has always been asked, right? Now, this is our Milky Way, and we are here. Depending on how you want to count this, we're on the third spiral out. Uh, there's two uh, spirals on the inside, so some may call it the fourth spiral, but there we are in a pretty pleasant part of the Milky Way, by the way. And uh, things here are pretty steady and not very chaotic, and we are able to look out and, and see things with uh, the length of time that our planet has been here, which We've been here for about four and a half billion years. Our sun has been here for about four and a half billion years. Um, there are other parts of the Milky Way where things aren't as nice and as peaceful as it is right here. But that's our Milky Way, and it's 150,000 light years across. So as we move forward here, I want you to always picture and go back to this image of the Milky Way and understand how big the Milky Way really is. It's 150,000 light years across. It will take you 150,000 years at the speed of light to get from one side of our Milky Way to the other. The Milky Way is a big place, but other things are bigger. Now, The biggest question yet that hasn't been answered was, you know, is our Earth and our eight little friends, depending on how you're counting, right, all that there is? Are there other planets out there? Are there other things out there? Our land-based observatories were getting bigger and their ability to look into deep space was getting better. And, you know, although good, it was always limited uh, to our atmosphere, which was always getting in the way. And the chances of seeing another planet orbiting another star that would be at a minimum many light years away, it all seemed nearly impossible. The answer seemed to be, you know, with a space based telescope. But everything changed in January 1992 when here astronomers Alexander Wolskan and Dale Frail announced the discovery of two planets orbiting the pulsar PSR 1257 plus 12. This discovery was confirmed and is generally considered to be the first definitive detection of exoplanets. Then, 
in October of 1995, it went down. Michael Mayer and Didier Calos of the University of Geneva announced the first definitive detection of an exoplanet orbiting a main sequence star, nearby G-type star 51 Pegasi. These first three exoplanets were discovered with land-based telescopes. Now, until this point in history, the number of planets outside of our solar system was zero. In fact, when anyone looked into the night sky and observed the stars, you know, that was the question. I wonder if any of these stars have a planet. You know, that's the question. And we now know when you walk outside, every star you see in the night sky, like this image here, has at least one exoplanet. Today we know this, right? And, and, and if you see a star with your own eye, you're also looking at a planet, every single one. Today, there are land-based telescopes. We have space-based telescopes. And here, uh, with uh, the exoplanet missions, uh, we have uh, Hubble. We have Spitzer, we have Kepler, we have the James Webb, which was just launched, and very soon we'll have the W first, or now as it is named, the Roman Space Telescope, and it's actually called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. But space-based is new, in, in action for just 30 years. But for thousands of years, everything took place right here on terra firma, looking up. That's what we did. Telescopes, like, you know, like real ones, have only been around for the last 500 years. The big stuff, right, the, the big land-based telescopes today, barely 100 years. Remember, Edwin Hubble's telescope at Mount Palomar that you saw in the image earlier wasn't installed until 1922. That's just 100 years ago. Now, today, we have ground-based telescopes. And this first one is the Magellan II, which is in uh, La Campanas Observatory in Chile. Uh, we have the NEID instrument at Wind Peak in Arizona, at Kitt Peak, in Arizona. Uh, we also have the very famous Keck Observatory in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. And of course, we have the Hale Telescope at Palomar in California. Now, for the space based side of things, let's get straight to Hubble. Hubble. Hubble was launched into low Earth orbit in 1990, five years before, well, three years, two years, depending on how you want to count it, before the first exoplanet was discovered with a land-based telescope. Hubble remains in operation today. It was not the first space telescope but it is one of the largest. When Hubble was launched, we didn't actually know how many galaxies were out there. We still don't. But we also thought that the stars we were seeing in our land-based telescopes were just stars. Now, the first images that came back from Hubble were absolutely incredible. Like this here. The ground-based image on the left is from the La Campanas Observatory, right? That's there. We thought that was pretty good. It's pixelated, right? And then the Hubble Space Telescope's first image came back from the very same area, and you can see how detailed it was. And this was an exciting, exciting time for science. Um, now, this next pick is the first image from Hubble of deep space. And for the first time, the world of science and the world in general found out that the stars are not stars. Each speck of light that you see here is another galaxy. 
galaxies that seem to go on forever. Prior to this image with land-based telescopes, we thought those specks of light were stars. Now we understood that what we were observing from the ground was endless galaxies. Now, let's go to this next image because this next image is the first image from Hubble's Deep Field Mission. NASA decided that uh, to find the most empty space in this image here, to find the most empty spot, the most lonesome spot with nothing going on, and uh, expose it for two weeks. They just wanted to see what would be found. So in this next image, this is the area they decided on. That little red rectangle. As you can see, there are no stars. There is nothing in this image. They exposed this area with Hubble for two weeks. And what did they find? They found this. I need you to take a close look at this image. Every single speck of light in this image is another galaxy. Every single one. It's estimated that in this image, which, uh, you know, just like uh, the head of a pin in the night sky, there's 150,000 galaxies. Now, 100 years ago, Edwin Hubble discovered Andromeda, the first galaxy beyond the Milky Way. Today, today, a general number that is thrown around is there are at least one trillion galaxies in the universe. With each galaxy, on average, of one trillion stars. And at least one trillion planets to go along with them. Now, I want you to continue to take a long look at this image of Hubble's deep, deep field image. Right? It is just a tiny hole in the night sky. Seriously, the size of a head of a pin. Now, I want you to pick out a light. Just, just pick out one little speck of light. That speck of light that you're looking at represents our Milky Way. Think about that. How big is our Milky Way? 150,000 light years across. And it would just be a little speck in this image. Yes, that tiny light that you just picked out, our Milky Way, is over 150,000 light years across. Now, it is now understood that there are over 500 billion stars surrounding our planet Earth, with one trillion planets orbiting those stars. One million is a big number, right? One million dollars. One million is a big number. Well, there are 1,000 millions in just one billion and 1,000 billions for a trillion. We all know this. And these big numbers are thrown around all the time without real consideration of how giant they really are. So if just one star out of a million had a habitable planet, that means there are at least 50 to 80 billion rocky Earth-like planets with water in the Goldilocks zone right here in our neighborhood, our neighborhood called the Milky Way. That's right. In that little speck of light that you picked out in the Hubble deep, deep fill image, ponder that for a second. But the Hubble telescope didn't find any exoplanets. Sure, well, it did, eventually. 
but it showed us how big everything was and is. But everything was still happening on terra firma. By the year 2000, there was just eight confirmed exoplanets discovered and confirmed 22 years ago. But things were about to change. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, aliens and exoplanets. Two and a half hours of the good stuff. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Unex and Game Changer Networks. Race Hobbs. This is Fade to Black. I will be right back after this short break. We're going to pick up with part two. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. 2022 MUFON Symposium is in Denver, Colorado, July 7th through 10th, and it's on. If you can't make it to Denver, get the live stream. You can watch it live and anytime later. This year's theme is UFOs in the Spotlight. Our speaker lineup is incredible. Join Cheryl Jones, Peter Robbins, Michael Schratt, Kathleen Martin, Tom Reed, Paul Hynek, Peter Davenport, Dave Scott, Craig Campobasso, Donald Schmidt, Mark D'Antonio, and me, Ron James, for an exciting inside look at my new film. Newsflash, Congressman Tim Bruchette has just confirmed that he will be making an exclusive live presentation at MUFON 2022. Tim is the most outspoken member of Congress on the UAP topic. You do not want to miss what he has to say. Sign up for our live stream. Get all three days of the MUFON Symposium, a one-year subscription to MUFON TV, and an awesome free gift. What's the free gift? Find out at MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. That's MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. You do not want to miss a thing. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here, and I know what you're thinking. Lately, Jimmy sounds so fresh. He's so alert. He's so now. Well, that's because of biotech research and their new supplement, Brain Peak 9. Brain Peak 9 contains nine nutrients that may help support brain function of memory, concentration, recall, and improve focus. Other memory supplements can cost as much as 129 bucks for a 60-day supply. But right Right now, for a limited time, if you use the discount code FADER, that's right, F-A-D-E-R, just for the Fader Knots, you'll get a 60-day supply for just 49 bucks. There's no better time than right now to see what others have been raving about. Help improve your brain function. Go to BrainPeak9.com and enter the discount code FADER. That's right, for the Fader Knots. That's BrainPeak9.com, discount code FADER. And the links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Click on it now. Seriously. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. 
Einstein, the Ancient Crystal Skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. My name is Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Hobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Tonight, two and a half hours. Going to get straight back to it of aliens and exoplanets. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. And this next image here, this is the Spitzer. This is the Spitzer Space Telescope launched in 2003. The Spitzer Space Telescope's mission ended on January 30th, 2020, after scanning the universe in the infrared for over 16 years. Spitzer discovered many exoplanets, including the TRAPPIST-1 system, which we will discuss later. Spitzer's uh, original missions uh, ended up getting modified about halfway through, And they rewrote the software when they found out that Spitzer in the infrared could help discover exoplanets. And it did. And it did a lot of very important work. And uh, Spitzer now uh, has been retired uh, for about a year and a half. Um, But its uh, mission was extended uh, by by years. And uh, TRAPPIST-1... Uh, is one of the most important discoveries, and we will get uh, to all of that, the TRAPPIST-1 system. There's uh, five, six exoplanets there. This is Kepler. Kepler is a retired space uh, telescope launched by NASA in 2009, uh, launched by NASA in 2009 to discover Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars. Planned for just a three and a half year mission, it lasted for nine and a half years after NASA announced his retirement on October 30th in 2018. The Kepler Space Telescope and its follow up observations have detected 2,398 confirmed planets. Uh, the number is much greater than that, and they are still to this day pouring over the data that Kepler has found for us. And we'll be going over those planets uh, later on tonight. Uh, Kepler's importance to the search for exoplanets cannot be measured. Now, this is TESS. TESS is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite Telescope launched in 2018 and designed to search for exoplanets using the transit method in an area 400 times larger than that covered by the Kepler mission. Its mission will end in September of this year. 
The test missions are complex. Approximately 500,000 stars are to be studied during its mission, and including 1,000 closest red dwarf stars, confirming 3,000 transiting exoplanet candidates with 500 Earth-sized planets. Now, the survey is broken up into uh, uh, this image here, by the way, is the test assembly. And I included this here so you could see the size of uh, this telescope. And it's got four imaging cameras in the middle. Um, and you can uh, clearly see those there. And this was right before its launch. Now, uh, the survey is broken up into 26 observation sectors, 13 per celestial hemisphere, with 20,000 stars in each sector. The first year is the southern half. The second year is the northern sky and repeating everything for year three and four with a new set of target stars. Now here... You can see uh, each sector, and you can also see the northern and southern hemispheres and how this is done. So again, one year south, one year north. It focuses on each sector and, and measures the transiting light changes for each star, studying 20,000 stars at a time per, specter, uh, per section. Now, here is the James Webb. The James Webb Space Telescope was launched on December 25th, 2021, last year, and its first official mission images will be seen on July 12th, uh, next week, 2022. Its mission duration is a planned 20 years. Now, next up, and this is very interesting, this is, oh, oh, I uh, want to talk about this really quick. This is the James Webb L2 point. Now, uh, this Lagrange point, L2, is very specific. It's one million miles from Earth. Now, the reason why the L2 point is selected is because the Earth is positioned between the James Webb telescope and our sun. This will block the sun's light and allow imaging looking out in the other direction without any light pollution. And you know how it is. When you live in a populated city that's lit up and you look up at the night sky, you don't see any stars. You're lucky if you see one or two, like I used to have uh, here in Los Angeles. I would look up in the sky and I wouldn't see any stars. I could go out to Joshua Tree, and I could see the entire Milky Way, just 60 miles from my home over in Burbank. The same sky above me over in Burbank, I got nothing. Out at Joshua Tree, no light pollution, I can see the Milky Way with its colors and the magentas and the blues. It was absolutely incredible. So I knew the stars were there. I just couldn't see him in Los Angeles, right? Now I'm out here in the Mojave Desert. I've got the Milky Way again above me, and I get to enjoy the night sky. That is the purpose of the L2 Lagrange point. It positions the Earth perfectly at a million miles away to block out the sun. Now, there's other reflectors and there's uh, screens that the James Webb is a very large telescope uh, once it is fully deployed like it is now. And it, its mission <laughs> is to photograph everything and to image everything in the infrared, but to block out as much sunlight as possible. And that's the purpose of the L2 point. Now you know. Okay. These images uh, that just came back from the James Webb Telescope um, were amazing. Now, as great as Hubble was, and if you look at the top, uh, to the top left corner, that is Hubble's first image of the galaxy that we got back, and we were so impressed uh, of the universe that we got back, and we were so impressed with the amount of galaxies that were there and the imaging. Right? We loved it. Now, below 
is the James Webb Telescope's image of the exact same part of the universe. And look at the difference in the imaging quality. Okay, so on the left, it, lower left, is the same image area of the Hubble telescope, and then there is a galaxy that is blown up. In the upper right-hand corner was the image that blew us away by Hubble back in 1990. Below, look at the James Webb. You can see multiple large stars inside of that galaxy that we had no idea were there before. This is how good the James Webb is, and it's imaging that's going to start coming back to us on July 12th. Be prepared, because it is going to be incredible. Now, there are many ways uh, uh, to look. And the W first or the Roman Space Telescope, will launch in 2027. Its mission is to search for exoplanets and also the expansion history of the universe. It's also going to look for dark energy and dark matter and the consistency of general relativity from Albert Einstein and also the curvature of space-time. This is where we are today with space telescopes. Now, uh, I, I've shown you five here. We have many space telescopes that are out there that are doing different missions, but these are the space telescopes that are focused on the search for exoplanets. The amazing part for me with all of this is that we are now able to go and search into deep space thousands, if not millions, of light years away, where before none of this was even seen. And once Hubble kicked off in 1990, and we realized the size of the universe and how many galaxies were actually out there, this is when everything went up a notch. And we knew that the atmosphere here on Earth was limiting everything with these giant telescopes that we are using and still use uh, and they uh, allow for incredible imaging. And the combination, the way that TESS is working, uh, the way that the James Webb is, is set to do its missions, and the W first, all of these um, are working together in conjunction with and uh, uh, synchronized with our land-based observation platforms uh, around the world. And it's this data collection that we are able to do with computers and sharing this, we are able to do all of the imaging that is going on right now, including black holes. Okay, now, the different search methods that are out there, um, the first one is the transit method. Now, what is a transit? A transit occurs when a planet's orbit carries it directly in front of its parent star as viewed from the observer's perspective. Now, remember, you would have to observe it on the ecliptic, okay? And that is how you are able to see it. So the planet is here, and, or the star is here, and the planet is orbiting this way. If the planet is orbiting this way, you're not going to have a transit. You're not going to have a light degradation. So there are different methods for that. I'll get to that in just a second. But the transit is this way, viewing sideways on the elliptic from the observer's perspective. This results in a temporary and periodic drop in the star's brightness. And you can see it here on how it's measured. I've got some more information coming up in a second. Now, the results in this stars, uh, the drop in the star's brightness allow for a few things. And thousands of exoplanets have been discovered through this method. And thousands of additional candidates await confirmation, largely thanks to NASA's Kepler mission that I mentioned earlier. Now, um, what is a habitable zone? We're going to be discussing that in depth tonight. The habitable zone is the range of distances from a star where temperatures allow liquid water 
right? That's it. You need to have liquid water to persist on a planet's surface, right? If, if, if you're going to have life or the chance for life to develop, you're going to want liquid water. Now, since water is necessary for life as we know it, its presence is required for worlds to be considered capable of supporting life. All right, and all of that is based on what we know here on Earth, right? We've got liquid water. We know the temperatures, we know how to measure it, and we now know what to look for. The second uh, way of uh, finding exoplanets um, uh, is transit photometry which is part of the transit method. Monitoring the change in brightness of a star as an orbiting planet passes in front of it, like NASA's Kepler missions, TESS will use this method to find exoplanets. Transits typically last from 1 to 10 hours. Most transits from planets TESS will find will last for just a few hours. And here is the actual software as it comes back. So you can see the consistent line of the star's brightness on the top, and then you can see the dramatic drops in brightness. And as soon as you see this, Tess's computer systems will be triggered. All of this is happening automatically. This is not done with the human eye. Tess is scanning 20,000 stars at a time per sector. And as the computer is observing each one of these stars, if a change happens with the transit, it's going to happen immediately. We don't have to wait for the data to be observed by an astronomer or an astrophysicist. Now, what is the radial velocity exoplanet detection method? Now, um, most, of the, most of us know this as the wobble effect. Okay, now I'm going to take a little uh, time here to explain how this happened. This occurs in response to the gravitational tug of an orbiting planet. These movements produce shifts in the star's spectrum and tell us about the mass of the orbiting planet. Some of the planets that test finds will be observed by ground-based telescopes using precise instruments to measure radial velocity. Now, how this occurs is this. And especially if you are not on the elliptic to observe a transit. So if a planet is going around a star, as it moves, its gravity is going to tug on the star and pull it in another direction. We will be able to see it's very small measurements, but we are able to see the star move. We are able to see it wobble. Now, think about this. I had mentioned earlier, this isn't all space-based. We need the ground-based telescopes from around the, wor uh, around the world to do these kind of measurements. And all of this tests and the triangulation and the communication with the, uh, with the ground-based telescopes from around the world, we are able to use the wobble method to detect the gravitational changes with a star. All right. This is one to me. This is one of the coolest methods, and was also one of the first methods used to detect exoplanets. Now, I want to take you through. Did you hear that? That wasn't something falling in here. That was. That was. Fun. Yeah, it's uh, it's getting a little loud. And uh, happy Fourth of July, everybody. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Should we just take a moment? Oh, of course. Now there's nothing. I want to uh, go through, uh, start uh, looking at some exoplanets. Now, I have selected uh, uh, just over a dozen of some of the coolest exoplanets that have been discovered so far and uh, and their designations. And you can also go through and do your own research on each one of these exoplanets. And for me to share all of the information that has been gathered, 
uh, would just take forever. But uh, I've got a pretty cool collection here. Now, there's there's another uh, point that I want to make before uh, we continue, is that the ability to find a planet, not a star, but a planet a thousand light years away, 500 light years away, four light years away, is, is an amazing leap in technology. And to think that we have come this far in just 25 short years, 1995 was 27 years ago. And to go through that kind of timeline to, to have two, maybe three exoplanets, and it took a few years to confirm all of that by 1995, by the year 2000, we only had five, eight, eight uh, exoplanets in the books by the year 2000. Today, if you're an astronomer or if you're an astrophysicist, one of the coolest things that you can do is go to work because you are guaranteed to find an exoplanet. Now, I want you to understand really quick how important this is. When you look up in the night sky, and you are in your backyard. Typically, on a clear night, you can see up to 5,000 stars. 5,000, horizon to horizon, back and forth, up, up. 5,000 stars. Every single one of those stars that you are looking at has at least one planet. So if you're an astronomer... How easy is that? Pick a star and study it. That's why we have uh, 10,000 candidates right now. I'll get to all of that. That's why we have 10,000 candidates. We have 5,000 confirmed exoplanets in the books right now. Everything that we look at, we now know and we understand that every star has at least one exoplanet in it. And the the mountains of data, which I'm going to get to in, in just a bit and, and go over all of this, is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. We don't have enough astronomers to pour over the data. Uh, the computers are cranking through this. We still have to go back and confirm the computer's data and analysis, and there just isn't enough time. And as we move forward, and I'm going to go through this, as we move forward in the month, days, and years ahead, this data is going to compound. It's going to be huge and overwhelming. And those numbers, which I'm going to disclose to you after the break, are absolutely incredible. So when we come back, I'm going to tease you with this. We're going to start going through these exoplanets. And this first one that uh, I'm going to discuss right here before the break is here's a partial list and the sizes of these planets. Now, I want you to take a look here and understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so there's the moon, there's Earth, there's Venus, there's Mars. And here are some of the exoplanets that we're going to be discussing in just a bit and why they are so important. Our focus in the search for exoplanets is we want to find Earth-like, Earth-sized, rocky, with water in the habitable zone. That's what we're interested in. Yes, we can find a, a planet by a star that is a gas giant. That's great. We're never going to live there, right? That, that, that's not what we're interested in. And it certainly doesn't support life. We are looking for signs of life. So we want Earth-like planets in the habitable, in the Goldilocks zone, with water and an atmosphere. And these are some of the planets here that we are going to look at. And the first one is Kepler-20b. Kepler-20b is classified as a super-Earth this is an iron-rich, rocky world in the Goldilocks zone. 
We are continuing to study every every Earth-like planet that we find in the Goldilocks zone. We can go and catalog it, but then we have to go back and look. We have to check for its temperature. And one of the things that the James Webb is going to do is going to go through the list of data and candidates. It's going to go look at these rocky Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone and start to study their atmosphere. What is there? Is there nitrogen? Is there oxygen? Is there water? Is there carbon monoxide? Is there methane? All of the things that we know we need here on Earth that will not only support life, but show signs of life. And of course, methane and how it is created, there's a few ways to do that, also is a strong indicator of life, organic life on these planets. Kepler-20b is one of the highest rated candidates out of all of them. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, aliens... And exoplanets. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Two and a half hours tonight of nothing but the good stuff. That's right. On the Game Changer and NX Networks, Race Hobbs. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the fader knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day. As an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little... That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now.
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back, Fade to Black. Tonight, aliens and exoplanets. We're going to keep going straight back into this with the fireworks going off in the background because today is July 4th. Now, this next image, this is Galice 667CC. And it is just 22 light years from Earth. It is one of the most studied exoplanet, and it is in the habitable zone. This is an artist's impression of what Galice 667cc just may look like on its surface. And as you can see, it has got two suns. It is orbiting two stars. Now, William just posted in the chat room a little bit ago, Uh, A great question. And his question was, what about telescopes that can see things in real time? Right? Yeah, absolutely. We know if we are looking at a star or a planet that is 1,000 light years away, it is 1,000 years in its past. We are not looking at uh, that planet, that exoplanet, as it is today. It's 1,000 years ago. Okay, as light travels at the speed of light. So something is a million years away. We are looking at something a million years in the past. And remember that if an ET civilization is doing the same thing, looking at us with a telescope from a million years, uh, a million light years away, they would be looking at Earth a million years ago. They would be looking at a uh, prehistoric man on uh, in in southern Africa, right? But about sixty five million light years, they would be looking at dinosaurs. They wouldn't be looking at Earth in real time. But Galice six six seven CC is just twenty two light years away. So we are observing this planet as it was just twenty two years ago. James Webb is going to be focused on Galice 667CC. It is a very important planet. Now, this next image, this next planet is Kepler 22b. Now, Kepler 22b is 600 light years away and was the first Kepler planet found in the habitable zone. And you can see here in this image where it lies in the habitable zone, and it is on the inside of it. Fortunately, its star is not that hot. So even though it's inside of what we would call the habitable zone, its sun is running at a cooler temperature. So we would consider this right in the middle of where it needs to be. And we also think that Kepler-22b is covered in water. 
and uh, maybe as much water as we have here on Earth. Again, this will be a major focus for the James Webb Space Telescope. This next exoplanet, now there are a few here. This is in Kepler 62F. Now, uh, Kepler 62, the system, has one, two, three, four, five, six, f- five, uh, uh, five planets orbiting it. Um, and this one, which is Kepler 62F, is about 40% larger than Earth and orbits a star, again, much cooler than our sun. It also has a very happening 267-day orbit. Now, this also puts uh, 62F, Kepler 62F, squarely within the habitable zone. And again, this is a major focus for the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, This next uh, exoplanet, this is Kepler 69C. Now, this is the Kepler 69 system, which has, uh, for, for now, two exoplanets orbiting. And 69C completes one orbit every 242 days. And its host star is, again, about 80% as luminous as our sun. So the planet is right in the habitable zone, also because their sun runs at 80% of our sun. So this is a big candidate, and we are also going to be looking at its atmosphere. It's uh, another very important planet. Now, uh, up next is Kepler 186F. Now, 186F is interesting because it's just 10% larger than our Earth. It also is right in the middle of its habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, of its star. It receives just one-third of the energy from its star that the Earth gets from our sun. We know uh, through uh, the research that we have done on 186F that its temperature is right where it needs to be for liquid water. And it is a very interesting planet. Again, um, everything that I'm presenting to you now, uh, the James Webb and Tess, the James Webb has uh, uh, very specific uh, stars, star system, and planets that it is going to be looking at. This list that I'm presenting to you right now represents Uh, a part of that list for the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope is able to look at atmospheres and for signs of life. Um, One of the points that Avi Loeb has brought up uh, is, would we be able to see, with the James Webb Space Telescope, light? Okay, the dark side as the planet is turning, right, from day to night, would we see lights from cities? Would we be able to see industry? Would we be able to see this kind of stuff on the dark side of a planet? And we're going to be looking at this information from the James Webb uh, Space Telescope because we want technical signatures. And carbon monoxide is a technical signature of uh, an industrial age. We also know that with Earth, that we entered the industrial age, and we've been in the middle of it for about 200 years, a little, little over 200 years, coal burning, factories uh, creating pollution, Uh, carbon monoxide and other pollutants and gases going into the air that mark a technical signature, okay? And will we be able to look? That's what the James Webb is going to be looking for in addition to the other stuff that is needed for life. And Kepler 186F is one of these candidates. All right, next up is 
uh, one of my favorite planets. Uh, well, they all of these are. Um, I have been researching the subject for a very long time, and I announce on the show um, uh, when uh, another exoplanet that is Earth-like, the gas giants, that's exciting. And I'm glad that we have the, the ability to observe those. I want to know about uh, rocky Earth-like planets with water and an atmosphere in the habitable zone, in the Goldilocks zone. That's what I'm interested in. And when these... Uh, planets are announced, I immediately catalog them. I have a huge list of them, and these are some of my favorites. And 186F is one of those. And this next planet, Kepler 442b, is the first near-Earth side planet that orbits around a star the size of our sun. Now, check this out. Are you ready? It's one of my favorite planets for a lot of different reasons. Okay? Now, it's got a sun. Holy crap. <laughs> I've got headphones on. And if it's that loud in here, in a soundproof <laughs> room... <laughs> Soundproof. I can't hear anything outside when I'm in here. And uh, it is indeed the 4th of July. So um, 442B has a sun the size of ours. Um, 442B orbits in the habitable zone. And not only that, it's rocky. Not only that, it appears to have water. And not only that. It has a 385-day year. So this planet is turning. This planet is orbiting a sun like ours. This planet is the same distance from its sun as we are from our sun. And it also has a 385-day year. We have 365 days. 442b is 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 checking all of the boxes and once again the James Webb telescope is going to be looking at Kepler 442b remember Kepler 442b next up next up <laughs> i knew it was going to be interesting to have this show tonight on the 4th of July Kepler 16 uh oh wait 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 hold on hold on uh, this is Kepler. Oh, oh, I did it out of order. Let's go back. This is Kepler 442b. It's 33% larger than the Earth, completes its orbit in 112 days. This exoplanet receives enough light to sustain, are you ready for this? A large biosphere. Right now, the research is indicating that Kepler 442b has photosynthesis. So, in this artist's rendition of Kepler 442b, you can see green. Kepler 442b, absolutely incredible. This is Kepler 452b. It is also another near Earth sized planet. And this is the planet that I was talking about. Uh, I was going off of memory. Kepler 452b, not 442b, 452b. This is another star system. This orbits its sun 385 days a year. Now, it is also rocky, and it is uh, looks like, with research, again, we only have so many astrophysicists and so many astronomers on this planet to do all of this research, but we think there is water, and it is also in the habitable zone. Okay, next up. Next up is Kepler 1649c. Kepler 1649c, I have uh, chosen this picture here because it is nearly the exact size of our Earth. It's also orbiting its stars, two of them, in the habitable zone. 
It receives 75% of the light on Earth that we get from our sun. Kepler 1649C, again, looks like it has an atmosphere. Um, it has oxygen. It has nitrogen. It appears we're going to continue uh, the study of 1649C, and there is water. So, again, uh, a focus for James Webb and Tess. Okay. Now, earlier, I talked about the Spitzer Telescope and TRAPPIST-1. The Spitzer uh, Space Telescope, uh, about halfway through its mission, got uh, new software installed, and its instruments were adjusted because they found out that Spitzer was perfect for looking at the transit method uh, for locating exoplanets. And what did it find? It found TRAPPIST-1. Now, this is TRAPPIST-1e. There are five exoplanets uh, around uh, its star, TRAPPIST, uh, number one. Um, number two, each one of those planets, and there are five, are nearly all of them perfectly in the habitable zone, but some are gas giants. But TRAPPIST-1e is just 40 light years away. It resides in the constellation Aquarius. Okay? TRAPPIST-1e is one of the most studied exoplanets uh, that have been discovered so far and confirmed for a lot of different reasons. Okay, TRAPPIST-1e may hold more water than Earth. It is perfectly in the middle of the Goldilocks zone. It is also thought to be the planet most likely to support life as we know it. Now, there are five planets in TRAPPIST, and out of all of the star systems out there, TRAPPIST is, is, is the one. I mentioned earlier... And I need you to understand this. When we look at our Milky Way and we are guessing and guesstimating, we don't know for sure, but we have somewhere north of 500 billion stars in the Milky Way. When I last had Avi Loeb on the show, one of the things that he pointed out that that doesn't mean 500 billion planets. It could be way over a trillion planets. Why? Well, we know in our star system here, we have eight, maybe nine with Pluto, depending on how you want to count things. We have eight, maybe nine planets here, maybe 10, right? Planet X. So how do we apply that to other stars? Now, with the formation, when a star forms. There is a ring of dust around that star. We have now seen the, the generation of star systems in action as they grow and as they form. And this dust ring accumulates. That's where planets are formed. And this is every star this is the process that it goes through. That's why we now know through research and data collection that every star has to have at least one planet there. And if it's a new star and it's a new forming star, then at least one planet is about to form around that star. But here we have eight planets, maybe nine, right? TRAPPIST, this star system, has five planets. Now, what if uh, we started to find two, three planets per star system in our Milky Way? That would push the numbers up to over a trillion, trillion and a half, maybe two trillion planets 
just in our Milky Way. Now, I'm going to get back to the importance of these numbers in just a bit, but that's how important Trappist is to us. And we know, oh, sirens. <laughs> so I've got sirens and fireworks. Okay, so that's TRAPPIST-1E. Again, it's 40 light years away. We are observing, that's the other exciting part about TRAPPIST, is we are observing these planets as they were just 40 years ago, nearly in real time, going back to William's question from earlier. Next up, this is Kepler-440b. Now, take a good look. Kepler-440b is about twice the size of Earth. It's also located within the habitable zone of Kepler-440, and liquid water probably exists, and the research is still coming in. And uh, here's the other part about Kepler-440b. It's close, number one. Uh, but the other part is everything seems right. The temperatures measure right. It's in the habitable zone, and it's, uh, it's the right size. It's rocky. This is a planet that could have life right now, and it's close by. Now, okay. I'm kind of saving uh, the best stuff for last as we move on. This is Kepler 1638b. Now, the cool things about uh, 1638b is it's orbiting a star just like our sun at about the same age, a sun that's going to last a star about 10 billion years, again, like our own sun. Now, while it's not identical to Earth, it's close. There is a likelihood that water is existing right now, liquid water on this planet. And it's thought to be more Earth-like than many other exoplanets. Life could exist right now on Kepler 1638b. One of the other considerations uh, that we have to look at is, as, I, as these fireworks are getting louder and louder, is that um, we know that us, Homo sapiens sapien, got upright and started to do things about 5,000 years ago at about 3,000 B.C. Now, all of this has been debated, and I, 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 I've discussed this uh, many, 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 many times, including last week on the show on my special about the pyramids. But let's just go with the data, the way that um, schools and our education system and educators are telling us when it comes to historical facts. So when we go and look at a planet that may support life, um, is it still there, right? So we're looking at a planet that is 500 light years away. Think about us here on this planet, where we are now in the year 2000. What's going to be here in the year 2500? Well, one of the things to consider is that right now with radio and television and, and radio signals, we've only emitted those out from this planet at most for about 150 years. That's it. Today, everything is moving towards fiber optics, and our communication systems are not necessarily with radio antennas, and we are not receiving television signals with antennas anymore. We're using digital transmissions. So our signature of radio waves emitting off of this planet are shrinking. And we need to take that into consideration when looking at other exoplanets, when we are looking for technical signatures. Another civilization out there looking at our planet would have to see us 
within the last 150 years. If they are looking for radio waves, if they are looking for television and radio signals emitting off of this planet, because in the next 50 years, we may have none. So if you are looking at us in that window, you'll be able to pick up those signatures like the movie Contact. Okay, uh, which went out to Vega, which was 39 light years away. And they picked up the radio and television signals from the Olympics in 1936. And they turned around and sent those signals back to us 36 years later, arriving here in 1996. Okay, it's the same thing that we need to consider when observing in the other direction. Kepler 1638b could absolutely support and be everything that we are on this planet. But if we're going to look for a technical signature, we may not see a radio signal or a television signal or radio waves because they may be just 50 years in the future from us now where they're not using radio waves. Again, that's where the James Webb Space Telescope comes into play. With that, I am going to take a break right here, and I'm going to come back with numero uno, right? What is numero uno? What is the number one exoplanet? I'm going to show that to you next when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight is our Aliens and Exoplanets special event on July 4th. I'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. 2022 MUFON Symposium is in Denver, Colorado, July 7th through 10th, and it's on. If you can't make it to Denver, get the live stream. You can watch it live and anytime later. This year's theme is UFOs in the Spotlight. Our speaker lineup is incredible. Join Cheryl Jones, Peter Robbins, Michael Schratt, Kathleen Martin, Tom Reed, Paul Hynek, Peter Davenport, Dave Scott, Craig Campobasso, Donald Schmidt, Mark D'Antonio, and me, Ron James, for an exciting inside look at my new film. Newsflash! Congressman Tim Bruchette has just confirmed that he will be making an exclusive live presentation at MUFON 2022. Tim is the most outspoken member of Congress on the UAP topic. You do not want to miss what he has to say. Sign up for our live stream. Get all three days of the MUFON Symposium, a one-year subscription to MUFON TV, and an awesome free gift. What's the free gift? Find out at MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. That's MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. You do not want to miss a thing. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. 
Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Sitting here listening to the fireworks. Happy 4th of July, everyone. And tonight is a very special uh, presentation on aliens and exoplanets. And I want to thank all of you uh, for coming in tonight and spending your 4th of July here with me. It's a very special day. And uh, and thank you for that. Uh, let, let's continue. And, and I want to say this um, really quick that I am cataloging uh, exoplanets and the interesting ones uh, on, on a daily basis. And I go and I look at them and, and consider, you know, what could be out there? Uh, could there be life there? And we know today uh, with uh, all of the information coming at us uh, with UAPs and UFOs in our community and, and certainly uh, the other things that are happening, uh, within the media and the Department of Defense and, and and Congress and, of course, you know, the Senate and the House of Representatives um, and their questions about what may be visiting this planet. Well, we have to look in the other direction. And what is science doing today? And what are they finding? And the amount of exoplanets that have been found so far and what is continuing to happen is just astonishing. It's shocking. And um, my my favorite exoplanets have been replaced by another and another and another. And this next exoplanet, which is currently, you know, at the top of the list for me and science in general, it is going to be replaced. And it could be replaced this week um, with the James Webb uh, Telescope going online uh, July, well, the first image is coming, it's already online, coming back uh, on July 12th, which is just next week, we could start to see confirmation of some pretty exciting stuff. And my current exoplanet favorite is going to be replaced. And it's that is going to be replaced, and it's going to re- be replaced once again. So this is Lighten B. And Lighten B, take a good look, 
kind of reminds you of something, doesn't it? It reminds you of us. Lighten B is both habitable and could have life on it right now. In fact, scientists are so convinced right now of potential life on the planet, they have been sending images to communicate with aliens. That's right. To lighten B. Now, why? The planet is just 12.4 light years away. It is three times the size of Earth. It is right next door. 12.4 light years away. We are observing this planet right now in nearly real time. That's light and B. We are sending images of us to that planet. Will we get a response back? Um, in preparation for this show tonight, um, I watched Contact last night. And I watched it for many reasons. Now, Contact, which came out in... In 1996, 1997, of course, based on the book by uh, Carl Sagan, um, I worked for a company back then called Alesis, and the director and some of the producers of Contact reached out to Alesis for some of the gear that we manufactured back then, specifically the ADAT. And the ADAT is, is and was back then uh, a digital recorder that recorded, well, audio, but music specifically. And uh, it was an impressive piece of kit. And the ADAT at that time was absolutely leading edge technology um, for recording uh, digital audio. Um, and many hit records were cut on ADAT. And they used ADAT in the film. So when Jodie Foster, you know, they make a, a detection, you know, that for, right? And they make the detection. And th she goes back and she's listening to the audio. She's looking at ADAT. Now, why is this important? Well, for me, I was interested in alien life. And, and UFOs. Uh, I work for a music company, but this is what I did uh, in as my hobby. I researched the UFO phenomenon. And here this movie was being made. I hadn't seen it yet. It uh, was being made, and they were using our gear. They sent us clips from the film um, where the ADATs were being used in uh, the uh, large array uh, radio telescope field in New Mexico where Jody Foster made the discovery. And um, <clears throat> I was able to see that. And then when the film came out and premiered, I went and watched it. And the film had a profound impact on me. There were some very specific things that Carl Sagan had done in the movie. And one of them was this, that I've talked about a lot on this show, which is, Around our planet, around our star system, we have uh, a couple of hundred stars that are between four and a half light years and 50 light years away. We have been, I just talked about this, we have been projecting out radio and television signals for the last 150 years. Okay? Now... If somebody out there was to receive those signals and then turn around and contact us, when could we expect that? Well, now, 2022. So let's cut that in half. Let's say, let's go with 70 years. That's 150 light years out, 140 light years out. How many stars with planets, all of them have planets, but how many stars are out there that are 150 light years away? There's approximately somewhere, depending on how you count, that was a loud one, 
um, between 250 and 500 star systems, and they all have planets. So right now, we could expect a response back, and it could be any day. Now, those signals now have been going out for 150 years. Now, if somebody is 150 light years away, then we wouldn't hear anything back for another 150 years. So that would be in the year 2170. But right now, in the year 2022, we should look at the star systems and those planets that are about 70 light years away. Now, having a response come back um, after 70 years is pretty cool. But if we find a planet like Lighten B, which is 12 and a half light years away and has everything that it takes to be in Earth, Lighten B is all of that. It has everything. It has water. It has an atmosphere. It's in the habitable zone. It's a rocky planet. It's got everything for signs of life. So if life got kickstarted somewhere, it's going to be light and B for sure. But here's the kicker. It's only 12.4 light years away. That means if we start sending signals to this planet now, we could potentially hear back from them in 12 years. Not in 150 years, not in 200 years, but by the year 2030. We've already been doing it, by the way, for a couple of years now. So it's possible that by the year 2030, we could get a hello response back from Light and B. We are so focused on this planet right now, and we really think that there is life on Light and B. So that's why Light and B right now is my number one. It's science's number one at this point, but it's going to get replaced. It's going to get replaced. We're going to find something else. Right now, you have to understand how Tess is looking at all of this. Tess in each sector every day as it moves to another sector, is looking at 20,000 stars. Those computers are going nuts. They are looking at everything, and they are finding transit. They are finding candidate planets every single day. All right? Now, this is where, for me, things start to get a little nuts. Because today, there are over 10,000 exoplanets waiting to be confirmed. Thousands more are being added each month. The data from TESS is still coming in. In fact, it's pouring in. James Webb is about to get involved. And we still have a backlog of Kepler data. And we only have so many astronomers and astrophysicists to pour over these numbers. The computers are going to do their work, right? But you still have to get humans involved. Now, this is, this is the concern. Right now, there are about 10,000 professional astronomers in the entire world. That's it. And I know what you're thinking. There must be hundreds of thousands of astronomers. There must be tons of... No, we only have 10,000 professional astronomers right now on the entire planet. That's it. We have another 8,000 astrophysicists. And not all of them are focused on looking out and, and looking at exoplanet data. They have other projects that they are working on, and that includes the astronomers. That's it. And there is an entire mountain of data. The data is huge, and it's overwhelming. Computers are able to locate candidate planets at a rate that just 10 years ago seemed utterly impossible. 
We are talking about, again, scanning 20,000 stars at a time every day, all year long. And we already know that every star has at least one planet. So what do we do, right? How do we look at this? If we find a star with five exoplanets on it, that's five times the amount of work. And we've got to go on to the next star and analyze that data. Computers can only do so much. Computers can give us the candidates, right? And then we have to go and look at that and analyze that. I have seen the computer systems. I've seen the laboratories, uh, not personally, in video, uh, that are uh, looking at all of this and the amount of exoplanets that are being looked at in real time, and you can see the data coming in, it's too much. And and one astronomer is potentially analyzing tens of thousands of candidates at a time. Again, there are only 10,000 astronomers on this planet. So you need to really think about that. Now, if we take things to the next level, today, to show you how crazy these numbers are, today, the Oxford Dictionary, today, contains full entries for 171,476 words. The hardcover edition is three inches thick. Okay? Put that in your mind. The Milky Way, not the universe. The Milky Way Exoplanet Dictionary, when it is completed, will contain over one trillion entries. Over 1 trillion entries when it's finished. So let's think about this for a second. The Oxford Dictionary contains 171,476 words. It's three inches thick. Now, just imagine if the Oxford Dictionary had 1 trillion words. Now, let's go back and review. A million, 1,000 times is a billion. 1,000 billions are a trillion. That's the amount of data that 10,000 astronomers are trying to tackle right now. It's impossible. The amount of exoplanets out there that can support life is extraordinarily huge. And we know that what we are facing is over 50 billion Earth-like rocky planets with water in the Goldilocks zone just in our Milky Way. Now, the Milky Way Exoplanet Dictionary will contain, when it's finished, over 1 trillion entries. Now, I've done the calculations. The Oxford Dictionary, 3 inches thick. The Milky Way Exoplanet Edition... That's over 100 miles tall. Think about it. That's the work that is going on today. So out of those 50 billion beautiful planets right now in the Goldilocks zone in our Milky Way, how many have intelligent life? Now, this is where things get controversial, right? And we've got the Drake equation. But let's say, let's say if we just go to some extraordinarily small number, like 0.01%. Are you doing the math in your head? Fifty billion Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone in our Milky Way, and if 0.01 percent had life, right? That's fifty million. 
50 million, 50 million planets with life in our neighborhood. Now, let's go back to the presentation when it started tonight. And I showed you the Hubble deep, 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 deep field image that had 150,000 galaxies in it. And each one of those galaxies with an average of a trillion stars. Some have more, some have less. But an average of a trillion stars in each galaxy. And I had you pick out a speck of light. And I told you that that speck of light that you picked out would represent our Milky Way. That little speck of light in that image, which is the size of the head of a pin in our night sky that has 150,000 galaxies in it, that little speck of light would have 50 million planets with life on it. That's our little speck of light in that Hubble deep, deep field image. Now, if you take that and you times that by one trillion, <laughs> think about what I just said. 50 million Earth-like planets in a galaxy with life, with life on it. And then take that times a trillion. That will put you in the ballpark for the stuff out there like us, out there right now in the universe, hanging out on their exoplanets. Think about that for a second. So when we go to the numbers game, of what is actually out there and how many alien advanced alien civilizations could be looking back at our planet, the number we can't comprehend. And that is the challenge that astronomers and astrophysicists right now are facing as they look at all of this data. Now, one thing is for sure, James Webb is going to come back with something, and it's going to come back with something astounding. It's going to be earth-changing, just like the fireworks that are igniting right now. So when I come back after this break, we're going to start to discuss that. Who is visiting this planet and how many? One of the considerations is what we are doing right now. I talked earlier that in 1997, we sent another rover back to the planet Mars in 1997 after 20 years, right? We are getting off planet. We are sending probes to the other planets in our solar system. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which are now interstellar are being shut off. But now are we truly an interstellar planet? Well, if this is what we are doing and we are building space telescopes and we are observing the stars and we now have gotten to the point in our history that we understand that every star has a planet. This has been firmly established, right? Aliens and those civilizations are doing the exact same thing. How long will it be until we have a probe that can go interstellar and visit another planet? With the advent of 3D uh, technology of copy machines and being able to do 3D printing, we can take that technology, send it out, Send it out to an asteroid. Build the probes there. Send more out. Those probes land on another asteroid and build themselves and then send themselves out in search for exoplanets and mapping the universe, right? That's where we are headed. Well, ET is doing the exact same thing. That's what we are facing. So as we consider 
what is visiting this planet, we have to think about what we are doing here. We're going to talk about all of that next. What are we doing? We are visiting the planets in our solar system. Our next challenge is to get to Alpha Centauri. We're going to, we want to get to Proxima A and B, four and a half light years away. It's very close. This is another project that Avi Loeb is working on right now to get to Proxima B in our lifetime. It's four and a half light years away. If we are doing this, ET is doing the very same thing. So when I come back after this break, I'm going to continue with aliens and exoplanets. This is Fade to Black on July 4th. And I do want to thank everybody that is here tonight listening to me hanging out on the 4th of July. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer and Unex Networks. Race Hobbs. Our meals, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. I'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here, and I know what you're thinking. Lately, Jimmy sounds so fresh. He's so alert. He's so now. Well, that's because of biotech research and their new supplement, Brain Peak 9. Brain Peak 9 contains nine nutrients that may help support brain function of memory, concentration, recall, and improve focus. Other memory supplements can cost as much as 129 bucks for a 60-day supply. But right now, for a limited time, if you use the discount code FADER, that's right, F-A-D-E-R, just for the Fader Knots, you'll get a 60-day supply for just 49 bucks. There's no better time than right now to see what others have been raving about. Help improve your brain function. Go to BrainPeak9.com and enter the discount code FADER. That's right, for the Fader Knots. That's BrainPeak9.com. Discount code FADER. And the links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Click on it now. Seriously. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden knowledge.tv your own library of information starts today at forbidden knowledge.tv your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db vx are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. 
with wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black, 4th of July. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight uh, for this very important presentation on aliens and exoplanets. So let's get to the alien component of this. And um, what I was just sitting here thinking uh, during the break, what would E.T. think, you know, flying over uh, the United States on the 4th of July and seeing uh, what we do here? And maybe they've uh, uh, done the same thing in their evolutionary process but wouldn't they be fascinated with that you know what are they doing are they shooting at each other are oh they're celebrating <laughs> well i mean what would et think okay so now let's look at at the hard numbers and let's take some things into consideration um when we look at uh what we are dealing with here All right, which is these numbers of 50 billion Earth-like planets in our own Milky Way. How do we how do we start to study that? How much time do you spend on each planet's discovery? We are now finding out now how daunting of a project that actually is, where we have only so many scientists and astronomers and astrophysicists on this planet that are looking at this data. How much time do you spend on each exoplanet, right? Do you spend a day? Do you spend a day? Do you spend a week? You know that waiting for you are another, not a dozen, thousands of exoplanets that need to be looked at and that data needs to be considered. And these planets have to be named. They have to be cataloged. They have to be finalized and and documented and then added to the database, right? And then what do you do? Well, you know that your work is never done. You are work. You are moving on to the next exoplanet. And if if there if the number right now just in our Milky Way is fifty billion, when is this work going to get completed? It's going to be hundreds of years in the future. And how many of those exoplanets have life on it? We don't know. Everyone is going to be looked at. Yes, it's exciting that we've launched the James Webb and we have the W first Roman uh, space telescope that is going to be launched in in 2027. That is going to be looking at a lot of different things, including exoplanets. It's the best that we can do. We can't move any faster. So. What about E.T.? So now let's flip 
all of that in reverse, and let's consider how E.T. is studying the Milky Way and maybe the universe. Well, they've got to do everything that we're doing, one planet at a time. And Earth is just one of those 50 billion planets. Where is it in the timeline? E.T. is cranking through one planet at a time. Has it gotten to Earth yet? Right? Maybe not. But if these numbers are what they are, then we know that if it's 0.1% of those 50 billion planets, that there are approximately 50 million advanced civilizations, right? 50 million that are turning around and looking at the universe and studying it. So how much time would they spend looking at a planet? Let's consider what has happened so far. It seems that we have multiple UFO sightings every single day. There has been a strange inconsistency in those sightings. I have had hundreds of UFO sightings. I have done sky watches. I have seen stuff during the day. I've seen stuff at night. I've seen stuff that I can't explain. I've seen stuff with shapes. It's not just lights in the sky. I've seen these, but no two sightings that I have have been identical. Now, why would that be? Okay, I think the answer is that these are different civilizations visiting this planet that are doing a drive-by, that are doing a catalog, stopping by here. Oh, there's life. There's intelligent life. It looks pretty cool. Okay, so we call this planet Earth, but they're going to call it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And they are going to move on to the next planet. That's it. That is one of the only, the simplest explanation to why things don't seem to repeat. Now, um, there is no question that we love this planet, this beautiful blue gem of a planet, and it's pretty awesome most of the time, right? We do have Las Vegas, and and this planet is great, right? But E.T. coming across Earth, some may be interested. Some may want to stop and spend some more time here. E.T. may stop by here and go, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, but it's not as cool as what we just checked out. And there's another planet that we need to go and look at that is also pretty cool. So, yes, here here is where they are in their in their evolution. Let's document that and let's move on. It would also explain why it appears like if we talk about the Tic Tac and other UAPs uh that appear to be probe-like. Now, why would that be something to consider? It's what we are doing. It's what we're doing with Mars. It's what we're doing with Saturn and Jupiter and the moon and Venus. Right now, we've got uh, probes uh, going back to Mercury and doing flybys there. It's easier to do that than put a human on it, right? Well, wouldn't E.T. be doing the exact same thing? But here's the rub. It would not be one E.T. race. It could potentially be 50 million different 
advanced alien civilizations out there right now mapping the Milky Way and mapping the universe and observing planets. And they would do that the easiest way possible with probes. And now, would a probe be intelligent? Yeah, there could be some AI involved, but there could also be some just basic software involved there, like uh, uh, collision avoidance, right? <laughs> we throw an F-18 out there to fly around this probe, and what does it do? It flies away. It doesn't want to be interfered with, right? Like some of the traits that the Tic Tac has exhibited, as described by Dave Fravor. That's, that's a sign of, you know, we're just here to look but we don't want to interfere with you, and we don't want to be interfered with. That's what we would do on another planet. We would do the exact same thing. And in, and it's with curiosity and perseverance on Mars. Right now, think about it. It's just a basic type of software. It's a basic type of surveying equipment. It's digging one inch, two inches, drilling into the, the rocks and digging up dirt, squirting water on it to see if, if something will grow. This is what E.T. would do. And it would spend a limited amount of time and then turn around and move on to the next planet. The same problems that we have here are the same problems that E.T. would have to be confronted with, which is billions of planets and only so much time to get the research done and to catalog it. I want to make uh, one quick comment before I move on. I, I keep going back to Hollywood. And if you go back uh, to, well, certainly Star Trek, um, Star Wars does this too as well. Stargate, Stargate Universe uh, did this amazingly well, which is traveling through space, warp speed, whatever, light speed, and you're coming up onto a planet. What are they say? Oh, this is an this is an uncharted planet. This is an unregistered planet. This is an uncatalogued planet. What do they do? They number it right, right then and 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 observe are there signs of life this is what is happening in hollywood and it is now repeating in in real life that we are absolutely finding stuff every day and having to catalog it the the numbers are incredible and this is what et would be doing that's why we don't see a, a repeat one of the things uh, that I need to, to comment on right now as I'm going through my notes is types of ET races. Now, remember, it used to be just like little green men, then, then the grays, and then suddenly the grays were two and three four types and heights and different attitudes. And then there were the Nordics. And then we have the, we have the tall heights and we have reptilians and we have mantis beings. And it seems that these types of beings, these races of aliens that are visiting this planet are growing every single day. And we turn around and say to ourselves, how can it be this way? Why isn't it just one? Why isn't it just one ET and everybody's just seeing all of these different types of and, and mantis beings, reptilians, Dracos? What's going on here? Well, of course. What is it that we would expect if there are 50 million potential advanced alien civilizations just right here in our Milky Way? I'm talking about in our celestial neighborhood. I laid it out in the very very beginning of the show um, specifically for a, a, a very important reason. Okay? The numbers are huge. They're huge. 
And if if that is the case and this type of life is out there, then what is visiting this earth? Well, potentially, on a daily basis, it could be thousands, thousands. How many do we see? How many do we observe? How is it possible that a craft with a, 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 a live biological being on it could enter our atmosphere and leave and nobody see it? That potential is high, is high. Now, the chances of us seeing one and then turn around and describing what we are seeing and they leave and then somebody else comes to this planet and they are seen and witnessed by by us and we describe it and it doesn't match what somebody else has seen. It's probably not only a different race of beings, but a race of beings that are millions of light years apart that aren't even aware of each other. This is what is visiting us every single day. And I keep going back to this same same scenario. Look at our fade or not audience, right? And I can flick to, to the comments right now. And Dan, Nolan, perfect, sub, dual, J, Juris, Nordic. Um, there's Bill. Uh, I can keep going back. There's Jax. There's names I can't pronounce. There's Jamie and Jessica and uh, uh, Screaming and WR. I, I can keep going back. A, a variety, right? No two fader knots look alike. And if I gathered 10 fader knots at random, and we all jumped on a ship and and went to another planet and started walking around, what would they see? They would think that we were from 10 different planets. Somebody's white, somebody's black, somebody's red, right? Somebody's got blonde hair, somebody's got curly hair, somebody's short, somebody's fat, somebody's skinny. What if we brought a dog and a cat with us? Right, We would appear to be different here on this planet, and this is where I'm going next, and then we'll wrap up this show. Here on this planet, everybody looks different, but we have two arms, two legs, hopefully 10 fingers and 10 toes, two eyes, nose, mouth, ears. All right, That's DNA. And the same DNA that is inside of me is on every living thing on this planet. That DNA is distributed throughout the universe on asteroids. And those amino acids are crash landing into different planets, just like life was jump started here. And what we have found is that we cannot stop life on this planet. We have tried over and over again to stop life on this planet. Nature and cosmic uh, disasters have, we've had five mass extinction events on this planet, everything wiped out, but life started again and thousands of species are created. That same DNA, those same fundamental 20 and 22 amino acids and RNA transferring that data into DNA and life starts again and it starts again and it starts again. We cannot stop life on this planet. That same chemistry is universal, and universal means everywhere in the universe. It's the same chemistry, the same atoms, the same molecules, and the same poly uh, uh, particles are everywhere throughout the universe, which also means in our Milky Way. That's it. Life is everywhere. Those same fundamental amino acids are on every planet. They're everywhere. So what is the difference between us and them? If those same amino acids and the same DNA and the same RNA is being distributed throughout the universe and throughout the Milky Way, well, two legs two arms, 10 fingers and 10 toes, two eyes, mouth, ear, nose. 
is universal. So why wouldn't we expect to have E.T. look like us? Now, the gravity on their planet, maybe they're short. Maybe they're tall. Maybe they're fat. Maybe they're skinny. Maybe the radiation is different. Maybe the, the, the ultraviolet particles that are coming through their atmosphere is different. So maybe their skin looks a little different. Maybe they see things in a different light spectrum. Maybe they see differently, just like we see differently, and the other species on this planet see differently, right? But two arms and two legs stepping off of a spacecraft should be expected. If we go to another planet and we step off, why wouldn't we see something that is fundamentally the same as us as RNA and DNA and amino acids are distributed throughout? Why wouldn't life just be similar? And that includes fruits and vegetables and trees and grass. Why wouldn't it be similar? Of course it would. So when we go and we observe an exoplanet and we step off of the craft, why wouldn't we see this? This is out there. This is out there probably times 50 million planets. We have 50 billion rocky Earth-like planets. How many of those? 0.01% supporting an advanced civilization. That's 50 million planets. That's 50 million planets. What if they are a 1,000 years ahead of us? We would see something like this. But we would probably see life that looks very similar to us, like this little alien standing out there surfing those waves. That's what is out there, and we shouldn't be surprised with that. And this atmosphere, this consideration, the nitrogen, the methane, the carbon monoxide, the carbon atmosphere, all of it, oxygen, water, H2O, in the habitable zone, this is what James Webb is out there looking for, signs like this. This is what is out there, and this is what is searching for us. The same wonder that we have as we look out to the skies, as we have done since the dawn of man, is are we alone in the universe? Well, we now know that this is existing out there. This could be on light and B right now. This is the most exciting time in the history of mankind right now. Our technology, our consideration, our consciousness, our wonderment, and the ability to ponder what is out there right now, we have the ability to go and find it. We didn't have this 25 years ago. We have it in 2022. And I am of the belief that our government and science knows that we are being visited. And right now, they need to talk about it. Technology is about to show us that there is life out there. I want to thank everybody for taking the time tonight to come and hang out with me for this very important presentation of aliens and exoplanets on the 4th of July. All right. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I will make the announcements for our guests throughout the week tomorrow. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer and Unex Networks. What a great night tonight. I want to thank everybody for hanging out on this 4th of July. Now, you can hear what is going on. So, I am about to go outside and watch it for myself. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. 
It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody tomorrow night. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. Go and celebrate the 4th of July. Do it the right way. I'll see you tomorrow. Go back, Lee Teppy.